first up, we have Neil talking about, well, in our food, fruit track, so if you're in the wrong place, this is for fruit. Um, I think at this point, we all know Neil, so he's going to give us some insight on managing for trees, perennial crops, um, fruit general. So this is the fruit general track. So um, we got it got you for 50 minutes, so. All right. All right. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. <clears throat> well, Colleen asked me to, she said, when you make this presentation, I want you to think about apples and blueberries and grapes. Well, that's a lot to put into one presentation, but I'm doing my best to say something about what's applicable in some cases to all of them, in some cases to uh, a portion. So we'll try to be clear about that as we go. Principal tree and vine crops we work with, Wine grapes, hops, almonds, or almonds, depending on which you prefer, walnuts, apples, and I don't have a picture there, but pecans is another large crop, tree crop that we work with. But basically, if you start looking at tree crops, any tree crop in the world will generally have, receive soil samples from. The, the one I've received the least samples from is tea. I don't have very many samples from tea growers. But otherwise, uh, pretty broad experience with crops in the various countries, that, uh, not just the U.S. What we try to do is start with clients where they are at present to help each achieve their own goals. In other words, we want to know what you want to accomplish. And as I said in the other program, we work with both conventional and organic growers. Again, we want to start where you want to start. Without an understanding of conventional fertility when trying to help convert to organic method, it can lead to a serious problem and possible disaster. You heard me refer to one. In, if you were there at the talk just before lunch. Uh, there could be other examples, but I think that's sufficient because I want to get through this. Pl what I look at this is, in terms of looking at uh, the presentation here, planning for the best while preparing for the worst. And I got that idea from working with a group of, uh, well, quite a lot of growers in Australia because they say, you know, one in every seven years, we expect a drought. We're going to have to live on the other six years. Well, uh, what we say is if you prepare in those, like one uh, client that I had, uh, and he said, you know, Neil, I used to raise 40 bushel wheat. But he said, then we had seven years of drought. And he said, I got the soils in shape. And he said, I never made 40 bushel wheat. At least I made was 75 bushel. Hmm. And he said, it was after getting the soil in shape. That applies not just to grasses. That applies to everything. Uh, this particular apple crop is in New Zealand, but uh, you learn a lot from different places by going to different places from the things that they experience. And I'm going to tell you, most of the U.S. doesn't have the same situation as New Zealand when it comes to apples and crops, but the soil that we look up at up here, you have many of the same problems that the apple growers in New Zealand have. And I'll try to cover that as we go along. Namely, one of them is making sure you have enough magnesium in your sandy soils. Sample depth, we talked about that somewhat this morning, but we tell no matter what kind of fruit tree or what else, when I first started, a lot of people that grew trees were taking 12 inch samples. If you want to take a 12 inch sample, that's fine. But my advice is take that 12 inch sample, take the top four inches and put that in one sample bag and put the rest of it in another sample bag and do that every time until you finally see what are we influencing? It's going to be that top four inches. It takes some years to get down to lower than that but in a, uh, in a, in a about between 350 and 400 acre vineyard several different uh, vineyard but one owner in Oregon they wanted to use all compost. They made compost. They had lots of compost. And they said, we want to use compost. And you tell us how much we can use on each different vineyard. And we want to use compost to the greatest extent we can use it to take care of our nutrient deficiencies. They had three different kinds of compost. Some were made with grape pumice, some made with other things. We analyzed the compost, analyzed the soils. And I said, you know what? What your soils need is what your compost lacks. They were making compost from their own stuff. Well, well, 
what I said is if, if all you try to do is use compost, you're not going to get the things that are lacking. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to supply what you really need to get the basis there and then use compost. They did that on everything except one 80-acre vineyard. And on that 80 acres, they said half of it, you just tell us how much compost we can put on, and that's all we're going to do. On the other side, tell us everything we need to do, and on all the rest of their vineyards, they did what the test showed didn't need to be done. And I could tell you a little bit more story of why they had the confidence, but the important thing I want to emphasize here is, after 10 years of treating, measuring the top four inches, after 10 years, we dug trenches and set, took soil samples every six inches all the way down to 48 inches. Wow. All the way down to 48 inches, every, every six inch sample. And on the side where they used compost, after you got out of the aerobic zone, there was no extra influence. They were using all that nutrient that they put on from the compost, but they were not supplying the things, the compost did not supply the things that were lacking. On the other side, where they w measured the top four inches and applied whatever showed to be called for over a 10 year period, the difference was 36 inches down. You could still find differences in that soil. Three feet. Because they put on what was required. And when I say differences, we dug trenches, uh, used backhoe and dug right between the vines and so forth. And five different people that were working with wine grapes crawled out into there and took a look. And every one of them said at least a third more root systems on the side where everything was applied that should have been versus on the side where only compost was used. The least was a third. A couple of the guys said, I'd say it's more closer to between 40 and 50% more. More roots three feet down in that soil just by treating the top four inches. That's because that's about all you can expect to put on what the top four inches can stand before you put on something that's too much. And when you put on too much of something, you're gonna affect the availability of something else. So as a consequence, the key is put on what you need. And what is that? As Dr. Albrecht used to say, take a look at your soils, and if you have too much of one thing, you'll have too little of something else. Put on what you don't have enough of, that's the first key to controlling what you have too much of. Uh, sampling flat areas, uh, again, we say take a four inch sample. The question is, have you done anything else right up under those blueberries that you didn't do out in the middles? And then, which one are you gonna believe? First thing I tell you, you wanna know what happens underneath? Well, if they're using a lot of compost or a lot of, uh, mulch is different than compost if you don't work it. If you use compost as a mulch and it all stays on top, that's one thing. If you use compost and work it in, you can have a completely different effect. Mulch is just an interaction between the very top of the soil and the bottom of the mulch layer. So it's a more or less a balanced breakdown. You don't tie up nutrients with that. But you take that same mulch and work it into the top few inches, and all of a sudden all the microbes come in and start to work on it, and then is when you start to, to see, well, uh oh, we're, we're having a far greater effect because we, we ruined that balance between the very top of the soil and the very bottom of the mulch. Working that in, then is when you start to cause the nutrients tie up because all those microbes move in and start confiscating things to try to break that down. Sample depth, oh, yes sir. So would you just lay the mulch on top for blueberries and not, not work it in? Uh, what, what we say is if you have Soil, then we'll, and we'll say, okay, you've put on all the compost you can stand. You're, uh, if you put on more than that, then you're going to cause the phosphorus to be too high or the potassium or something. Then we'll say, but if you put it on as a mulch and leave it on top, then it's just a slow feed, so you're not, you're not causing the same kind of breakdown that you would otherwise. So mulches are completely different than when you take compost and work it in for fertility. A mulch is more maintenance than an increase. Uh, sample depth, well, we asked that on the other one as well, and that is, you know, we'll have clients that have three different places when they're looking at trees or vine. They'll have right under the row where they've maybe fertilized a tremendous amount, then they'll have out in the middle where maybe they've done nothing, and then they'll have where they have a dripper or something, well, all of a sudden they got a real concentration there. Uh, 
maybe not on blueberry, but on a lot of tree crops, what we find is the, the people that rely on drippers for water and then they'll put extra potassium in there or they'll put extra nutrients in there. When you go out there and, and dig down where that dripper is, they might have a, on a tree crop a ball root as big as a basketball. Right there where they're putting that, where they're putting that fertility in. And the question is then, how much can you put on before you're causing a problem instead of solving a problem? If you're growing a tree crop and all of a sudden you start to see fruit drop or bloom drop or you know start to see dropping there, the very first thing to consider is how much potassium am I putting on? Because potassium, first of all, will give you better strength to hold the bloom or to hold the, the fruit or the nuts on the tree. But if your potassium gets so high that between the potassium and sodium it goes above 10% of the total holding capacity of that soil, it starts tying up manganese. Potassium is the first key to stalk strength and, and stem strength and holding the fruit on. Manganese is second. And we have clients who will put so much potassium in their drippers that they get a fruit drop because the potassium started tying up the manganese and it weakened it and it wouldn't hold the bloom or it wouldn't hold the fruit on the plant. It's, it, the question is when, what's enough, what's too much, what's not enough? And the only way I know to do that is to measure it. In terms of sample depth for middles and rows, if you're, gonna, if you're only going to put it all on top, it doesn't matter what we'd say. You take a four-inch sample. And I've had clients who said, but, you know, we raise grapes in the, in the vine go really deep. But how much influence are you going to have on anything down that far? If you put that on the top of the soil, it's going to influence about the top four inches. Now, when I say that, does that mean nothing's going more than four inches? That means the things that attach to the clay particles in the soil is going to be, you're concerned about four inches. That's the cation. The anions, nitrogen, sulfur, and boron, they're going to move on through. They're going to leach through. If you've got an open soil, it's either going to be used or it's going to be leached down into the soil and out with the soil water if you have good enough drainage. So I'm not speaking that everything just works in the top four inches, but the things that are going to stay around and cause you problem, that's the thing we want to look at in the top four inches. Uh, just again, a, a matter of different treatments under the trees and in the middles. And I put this in here to say this, we'll have clients who have extreme excesses under the trees. And then we'll come out there and check the middle at extreme deficiencies. One, uh, one client that I had, I said, well, he had compost. He said, well, I want to use all those compost. I said, well, put it out in the middles. You put it out in the middles instead of putting it under the tree. You know what? Those root systems, it was a thousand acres of walnuts. And those root systems within, they put it on in the one year. By the time I was there the next year, in the winter time, we went out there, got halfway in between the trees, started digging down with a pocket knife, got about that deep and there were roots crisscrossing one another from one row of trees to the other. The roots were going across, gathering those nutrients out of the middle. That's where they were getting the right nutrients. Under the trees, a, a plant has the ability to send its roots wherever you put the nutrients. But the thing about it is if you put too much and they're going for the dessert, which is like nitrogen, and they go in and, and put a glob of roots in that plate, the question is then, are they going to get the right nutrition or not? Uh, Francis Buquet is a, one of the smartest consultants I know of in terms of working with wine grapes in France. And he goes in and digs trenches. He'll get down in that trench and show you all the things that are happening. And the one thing that he shows you is even in tree crop, we dug right on the side of the desert out in California, right down in uh, where the Arizona-California line is coming out of, uh, of uh, Arizona and going into that big sand dune desert right there low, low on the I-10. They had a lemon grove right on the other side of those sand dunes. Now they, they actually drip irrigated, and this is a desert. They didn't get much rain at all. But when we went in there and used the backhoe and dug, those roots were crisscrossing each other from those trees. The, the roots were actually, and every place there was a little bit of nutrient, they had a little glob of roots there. Those trees know how to find nutrients. And if you think you can put it on one place, well, they'll make up for it somewhere else, generally they're going to take what's the easiest to get. And then the question is,
If that's easiest to get, are you blocking something else out? We already mentioned about, uh, this is actually the hop grower that I was mentioning who said he couldn't raise uh, hops, said he couldn't raise a cover crop, and now he raised two cover crops a year. He's been a client for 20 years, almost, maybe 19, but right at 20 years, and his humus levels keep going up with eight inches of rainfall and only drip irrigation. But they measure every block that they sample, they measure every orchard, they measure every farm, then they put all the farm together and they watch the computer trends to see what's happening. And the humus content is slowly going up, even in that dry type situation. The soil of the plant's stomach, we said, mentioned that earlier, but whatever digesting gets to be done, we have to make sure we don't mess it up in that soil. Importance of calcium in building soil fertility, a lot of people think uh, I must be crazy because calcium seems like I tell people that's an answer to a lot of things. It is an answer to a lot of things. But if you use too much, it's a problem. You need to measure and see where do we need it and put it there. And you can use whatever source is, is most available in terms of the cost. It isn't a matter that we tell everybody, oh, you got to use lime. But there are some places where we'll tell people, you should not use gypsum. If your calcium saturation is below 60% and you put gypsum on your soil, you're going to drive out calcium. You can watch the calcium levels go down on a soil test. And why is that? Because the sulfur is going to take out something. When that sulfur, if you put on more sulfur than the crop's going to use, a ton of gypsum puts on 335 pounds of sulfur. The crop's not going to use all that. Whatever's left over, it doesn't stick around. It converts to sulfate, sulfate sulfur, and it leaches away. Not as fast as nitrate, but it leaches out of the soil. Generally, you put on sulfur, and it's going to be hard to find it in one year, let alone two or three, unless you've got a compaction layer. So when we start looking at putting sulfur on in terms of calcium, putting that gypsum on, if the calcium is less than 60% saturation in those soils, the pore space is too little. It's too small. Nothing will move through there except calcium because calcium won't block up the pore space, whereas magnesium or potassium or sodium will. If you're above 60%, even if calcium is the most efficient thing there, you're still going to lose calcium. But as soon as you get that calcium above 60% saturation, which is the minimum Dr. Albrecht would always emphasize that you need, now all of a sudden whatever is in excess. If it's sodium that's in excess, that's what's going to leave. Not that everything's going to be sodium, but what you're going to see is that's going to make the big difference. That's going to be basically what leaves that soil. If you're, if you're putting on manures or compost and having extreme potassium excess, that's going to be what leaves that soil. If you've got an extreme magnesium excess, that's what's going to be. That's going to be what leaves the soil. And generally, if you have a calcium excess, you're not going to be putting gypsum on because it's got 450 pounds of calcium per ton anyway. Calcium deficiencies seldom show up in the field because secondary effects such as high soil acidity usually limit growth first. In other words, people look at it, they don't blame it on, oh, we don't have enough calcium. It is hard to tell if you don't have enough calcium unless you're measuring how much you have there. People say, oh, it's the pH that tells you. No, it isn't. I had a dairyman, a dairyman in Western Australia that came and had, he sent soil samples to us. When I came over there and put on a meeting for the dairyman, he handed me a soil test and said, what can I grow on this paddock? And I looked at it and the pH was 6.5. I looked at the rest of it and handed it back to him and I said, I wouldn't think anything would grow there. He said, it doesn't. Nothing grows there. It's barren. Not even weed. He said, nothing will grow on that paddock. It had a pH of 6.5. If pH of 6.5 is what matters, why would it not grow anything? because that whole pH was from sodium. He had extreme deficiency of potassium, extreme deficiency of magnesium, extreme deficiency of calcium. Until you came in there and fixed those, that place was not going to grow anything. Because, the, and the other part of that is, if you have an extreme amount of sodium, the first key to correcting that sodium is get your calcium leveled up, because you've got to open up that soil so that the sodium can leach out. What's happening is that sodium's collecting up there because the pore space is too little. As soon as you open that up, that sodium will move out of there. Proper fertility, not too little or too much, optimizes soil life, yields, profit, and 
quality and profit, and, I, and it all goes hand in hand. Now, you know, you might have somebody that doesn't necessarily know how to market it, so they might get good yields and good soil life and good quality and still not make a profit, depending on what, what's happening. But uh, basically, that's what enables you to make the profits. Calcium puts the starch in the leaf. We need calcium in order to get starch in the leaf. Why do we need starch in the leaf? Because then the boron takes the starch out of the leaf and puts it into the fruit. That's our fruit and seed builder. These clients signed up about, well, 20,000 acres of trees in a program. This is the first tree they ever planted. And they said, the big problem we have is we surface irrigate everything, but we can't get the water to go in the soil on these trees. So they switched off to uh, putting sprinklers in and the water still wouldn't go in, it, it would run off. They said, we can't get enough water in this soil so that we can make a decent crop to pay for itself. When we analyzed the soil, they needed two tons of calcium carbonate. Well, they had access to calcium carbonate with sugar beet lime, actually. Two tons of sugar beet lime, a ton of gypsum. They put that on, and I took this picture the first year when we were there. Uh, I took this picture, this particular picture, the second year when we were there, when they were irrigating, because they took me out there and said, look, look there's no water standing. It's all going in. And before, the water was running off and actually eroding the soil away. In one year's time, they changed the ability of that soil to take in water. In one year's time. Guess what the pH of those soils were? 7.7, seven, 7.8. Seven, seven, if you looked at pH, you'd never put calcium on those soils. It's not how, what your pH is, it's what your percentage of calcium is. If you have less than 60% calcium, we have clients who have pHs of eight and higher that still have to put on limestone because the calcium's less than 60%. It's the percentage that matters. The pounds tell you how to get the right percentages. Soil fertility for new tree and vine planting. First of all, we advise, if you can, start three years ahead of time. If you know where you're going to plant something new, maybe you've got something growing there already. But if you're going to tear that out and put something else in, take a look at what those soils need and start trying to get it. Because in some cases, it takes three. If you need limestone and you put on calcium carbonate, it takes three years to get the calcium, all the calcium out of there because limestone breaks down in terms of calcium carbonate lime, one-third the first year, one-third the second year, and one-third the third year. So you're only going to get, whenever you put limestone on, if it comes from a, a calcium limestone mine source, it's going to be three years before you see the full effects of what that lime does. And on sandy soils, it can be three years before you see the full effects and the calcium go up. But for every ton of calcium you put on, it also affects the availability of iron, manganese, copper, and zinc. When the calcium goes up, the others go down. This is in the literature, but they just don't tell you how much because nobody looks at percentages. But I can tell you, for every ton of lime you put on, in three years' time, it's going to tie up about the equivalent of 50 pounds of 21% ferrous sulfate. If you've got plenty of iron like the ones we saw in the apples this morning, you don't have to worry about it. But if your iron is just barely enough, like a lot of blueberry growers, and then all of a sudden you put on limestone and you drive it down, that's a disaster for blueberries. One of the reasons why people say, don't put calcium on blueberries. Well, the other, the other part of that is, uh, in terms of looking at correcting that, the calcium breaks down a third, a third, and a third, so you don't get the full response of the calcium for three years, but you don't see what happened to the manganese, which in about three years' time, it's going to tie up the equivalent of 25 pounds of 28% manganese sulfate. If you've got plenty, you don't have to worry about it, but if you're borderline or already deficient, it's going to make it worse. It's a matter of being able to look at the soil and say, when you put this lime on, this is going to be all right, this is going to be all right, but you better add this, or three years from now, it's going to be a problem. That's the, that is the problem. A lot of times people put on lime and they forget within three years that, that that lime is even there. It's causing the problem so much later than you forgot about when you put it on. Keep track of how much you put on and measure it. The, the test that we use to measure limestone was developed by Michigan State University. In the, Dr. Albrecht was teaching it 
back in his time, I don't even know how long ago they've used it. We use it on every limestone from all over the world and it works. It's the best test I've ever seen because it'll tell you how much calcium and how much magnesium you're gonna get based on the calcium content, the magnesium content, and the fineness of grind. And that's the part that Michigan worked out that so many people didn't work out. It has to do with the fineness of grind. How fine is that material? Because the finer the material, the more available it becomes. And, and when you finally get down to more than 60% through 100 meg screen, the finer it gets, the quicker it becomes available. Calcium carbonate lime takes three years to break down, but the sugar beet industry grinds it down to a much finer quality. In their case, it takes a year and a half for it to break down because it's so much finer. It's about 75% or higher through a 100 mesh screen. Pelletized lime, pelletized lime, it, well, they pulverize that and then build it back into a prill. That goes about 90% through a 300 mesh screen. It, powder would fly away if you didn't put it back into a prill. But that pelletized lime, you get the full effects of that lime in 12 months. Now it's a whole lot more costly, but it does work very quickly. For, for someone that needs a quick lime source, like with nurseries and people that, that grow landscape trees and so forth, when they're setting out, when they're making their potting soils and so forth, our recommendations are for pelletized limestone because they get the full response in 12 months. They don't have to wait three years. Consider the depth to which treatments are to be done. Now this is important if you're going to fertilize. The guy that this picture, he's getting ready to plant Merlot grapes in this area. They hadn't had grapes here before. But come in and analyze. And when you take your soil test, how deep you're going to work that soil. If you're going to put the fertility on for three years, you can take several different approaches. But there's an old rule of thumb. Worked out for no-till, but it works for everything. And that is, whatever depth you work a soil to, you can get a good homogeneous mixture by about half that depth. So if you work your soil 18 inches deep, about the top nine inches is gonna be a, a real good mix. Well, these guys say, say well, we've got a French plow and a big uh, uh, disc, and we're gonna work it 36 inches deep. I said, if you're gonna work it 36 inches deep, then what you wanna know is what kind of fertility you wanna put on in the top 18 inches. They did this on 3,000 acres. And you, you take a look at what's in the top six inches and what does that need? What's in the next six inches and what does that need? What's in the next six inches and what does that need? And the more you correct, now there's some uh, phosphorus and zinc, no sense in putting phosphorus and zinc, as far as what I would tell you, in, in, the, in anything below the aerobic zone. And the reason being, that's where phosphorus and zinc stays most available all the time. In our area where we got a lot of uh, clients that when we first started in the 70s were putting their land to grade to grow rice. And they'd cut off all down to four feet of topsoil sometime to get that level so they could water it. But what we found is you just shave off the top two inches, just like a turf grass grower. Take that top two inches, you've taken a big portion of your available phosphorus and zinc right there. My advice to you as a farmer is the deeper you take your test, the less it looks like phosphate's a problem. Now, all I'm saying there is, uh, you know, when you start looking at a soil, if you just take a four inch sample, that phosphate's gonna look like a whole lot different than it does at six inches or, and so forth. It's gonna look like you got a whole lot more than, than, in other words, you can have way too much in the top four inches, but you take a six inch sample or an eight inch sample, and all of a sudden it's gonna, that 8 inch sample is going to cut that in half almost because there's hardly anything available down deeper. It, this is what we find. Phosphorus and zinc are available right up in that uh, aerobic zone. But in terms of those treatments, whatever depth you're going to work to, just figure you're going to get a good mixture in between. That's why we say even if you're going to put fertilizer on and work it into the top two inches, that two inches plus the four inches below it is what you're going to influence. So that's why we say in soils that are going to be worked, take a six and a half to seven inch sample. In soil where everything's going to be put on top, take a four inch sample. Ripping with, with wet, low calcium soil smears and compacts. 
this this actually is a soil that was that was being prepared for grapes. They worked it too wet. They came in there and pulled a ripper through one way and a slip plow through the other way, and where they crossed, that's where they were going to plant the vine. We got a backhoe and dug down. Look at what they did. They put a compaction layer right through there where they pulled that through, and it just hardened out. Now you put a vine in there and think it's going to grow in that air. It's not. It's a matter of the first, the first key to getting soil to fall back together is to get a good calcium level there. That's the very first key, yes, sir. Would that compaction layer happen regardless of the moisture in the soil, so it dry or wet? Well, the, it, the com compaction layer there would not happen if it were not too wet. Now, if you're, if, I'm not saying it would never happen. If you had soil in this soil, it wouldn't have happened because the calcium levels were essentially good. But if you had a soil that had, like north of Sacramento, California, had 40% calcium and 45% magnesium, like some of those soils do, I don't think you can get it dry enough that it would not smear until you correct that calcium so we get more aeration in there. So it is a possibility, but the rule of thumb generally is if you can get your calcium up into the 60% range and then wait until the soil is what you'd say dry enough to work for planting or whatever, then come through and rip it. And to whatever depth you're ripping it, get you a tiling rod or some a penetrometer or something, go out there and push it down halfway in between where the shanks are running. And if it's dry enough, you should be able to push it down right in the middle, just as far down as it is on the side, as long as you can pull that ripper at least four and a half miles an hour. It'll, it'll actually crack that all in between so that you can get that down through. When you do that, then that's, that's really the ideal time to, to run that ripper or slip plow. In terms of talking about nutrients, Inadequate potassium or inadequate sodium? If you're an apple grower, you're not looking at sodium. If you're having trouble with a red apple, potassium is the first key to red color, but sodium is next. The apple growers in New Zealand always look at their sodium level because they find out if they can't get a good red apple, many times their sodium is deficient. We looked at one sodium this morning, I think it was on the alfalfa, but it was 24%, I'm sorry, 0.24%, it needs to be at least 0.5. And if you're not getting good color on an apple and you're at 0.5, we'll still raise that sodium level up to 0.75. Uh, sodium makes a big difference in color, not just for apples. Anything red, a red grape, a red apple, a red beet, anything that you're growing that has a red color to it, take a look even growing a red potato. A lot of people who grow potatoes have problem getting red in a red potato. And some of the things they do, some of the things they do you shouldn't do. <laughs> Soil potassium level for woody crops. If you're growing a woody crop, you need more potassium than growing grasses. Or you, uh, let's put it this way, to get the best results, more potassium. The ideal potassium for vines or trees, any type of woody crop, even cotton and okra is seven to seven and a half percent potassium. And that, if you don't have access to compost or manure, that generally gets hard to reach. But so many people, like what you're seeing right down there, will put that right down under the row, and they get up above seven and a half percent. As soon as you go above seven and a half percent potassium, start tying up boron. The next thing is, if it goes above 10 percent between the potassium and sodium, it starts blocking out manganese. It doesn't tie up. It'll tie up the boron. That means you ought to be able to see it reducing on the test. But for manganese, it can look like you're excellent. Look like you have twice as much as you need, and you still won't get enough manganese into that plant because the potassium and sodium crowd it out. It won't, they won't let the manganese get in. It's a, it's a law of chemistry that those two will force the manganese out of the way, and they'll get in instead of the manganese. And the higher that potassium gets, or sodium, above 10%, the harder it is for you to get that manganese into the plant. What difference does it make to have manganese? Well, you need manganese from start to finish. To germinate a seed, to get fast growth, to get to bloom, to get the fruit set, and then keep that plant growing all the way through the season. Manganese is, is one, of the, one of the things that we don't look at enough simply because most soils have enough. 
percent K in the soil, look at how many pounds of K you have in your compost or your manure. And whatever you've got in that compost and manure, you just watch and see if what I tell you is not true. If you'll measure that every year, let's say you put on the same amount and you say, okay, we need four tons of compost to get all the potassium we need for this crop this year. You put on four ton, come back next year, well, we're still, the potassium's still where it was. We just put on enough for the crop. Put on another four tons, come back at the end of the year, measure it again. Well, our potassium just where it was. The mistake is, don't keep thinking that's going to keep happening. The third year or the fourth year down the road, what you're going to find is the potassium goes up by more than how much you put on. The potassium actually, and the phosphorus will do the same thing because the microbial populations in there finally get to the point where they'll start releasing potassium and phosphorus that are tied up in a form the plant can't use and they'll start increasing that and it builds up as available P and K. You can build your P and K levels by using compost or manure, but generally it will take, if you're using moderate to small amounts, it'll take three to four years. Some people that put on huge amounts get it all the first year. The sandier the soil, the easier that is to do. I'm talking about easier it is to overuse. We've got clients with sandy soil with poultry manure that we have to tell, you gotta quit. They put on two tons of the acre for two years and say, you gotta quit. That's too much potassium. It may be too much phosphorus, but generally in the sands where we are, potassium gets to be the one that goes up. If you're using poultry manure or cattle manure, potassium's generally the one you gotta watch the most. If you're using pig manure, phosphorus is generally the one you have to watch the most. They're both going to go up, but pig manure seems to have much more uh, influence on phosphorus availability and cattle manure or poultry manure more influence on potassium availability. When you're putting on compost or manure, don't just measure the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in it. Most people will send in a manure sample or a compost sample. Well, tell us what the NPK is. What you want to know is not only NPK, but you also want to know calcium, magnesium, and if you're close to a salty area, you want to know the sodium. And a good idea to measure the sulfur, but not because of what you're going to get. It's just to show you hardly get anything. The sulfur in compost and manure is generally not even close to supplying enough of what we need. I understand there's some peaches going up here too, so I put one shot in of peaches. This was the largest peach grower in Southeast, was, he still is, the largest peach grower in Southeast Missouri. We went to see, actually, he was renting an 80 acres from one of our clients, and the client said, check that 80 acres of peaches and see what it needs to. We made the, we did the test and it came back. Potassium was his limiting factor. He was extremely deficient in potassium. And I, I asked the grower, I said, well, what kind of potassium do you use? Well, we don't use any. We don't put potassium on. I said, well, you know, why is that? He said, because all we can get is potassium chloride. We're not going to put potassium chloride on our peaches. I said, well, potassium sulfate is really a better source, all right. But I said, why do you not use potassium sulfate? And I thought he was going to say it's too high price. He said, we can't get it. Fertilizer dealer said, we can't get it. I said, the tobacco industry is right across the river. They were right on the Mississippi River. They won't ever put potassium chloride on their tobacco. They're going to put potassium sulfate on. You can just go over to one of those fertilizer dealers and get all the potassium sulfate you need. He went over, got the potassium sulfate on, and just putting on that first year, 250 pounds of potassium sulfate. Wasn't enough to even get them above 2%. Two, two he hardly had any time for it when we were making the soil recommendation because it just that wasn't something he looked at. But when we came back in peach harvest just to get some peaches, right when they were the busiest, he came out and he said, have you got 30 minutes? He took us to the peach orchard and started showing us. And he said, look how bumpy these roads are and stuff. He said, when we come out of here, we got these bouncing around and we get bruises and cracks in the skin and so forth. He said, we don't have any this year. They're not there. He said, we don't have bruises, we don't have cracks. And he said, what's more, the size of those peaches are so big, 94% of them are California grade peaches. And he said, I don't know if you know what that is or not, but what, those that we sell to California, that's our profit. And he said, before, we didn't get 50% California grade. Potassium is not just a key to stalk strength and wood strength, 
Potassium is the key to getting size on fruit, whether it's an apple or whether it's a peach, whether it's citrus. Crops need, looking at crop needs, if the soil can grow a crop, then sulfur is likely going to be more limited than calcium, most likely. If the, when you look at what does it need to grow a crop, and this is what we find many times, the soil that needs both calcium and sulfur, generally on looking at what it needs to grow this crop this year, the sulfur takes precedence over the calcium unless you have extreme calcium deficiency. If it grows a good crop, generally, if you're short in calcium and sulfur, we're going to tell you, put the sulfur on first. Sulfur for root and trunk growth. Sulfur makes this much difference. Now, I can't tell you what it ought to be on anybody else's soil test, but we'll tell you if you're growing a woody crop, you want a minimum of 50 parts per million sulfur from the, from the year you plant that tree or that vine. And the first thing you can find out whether sulfur makes a difference when you keep it above 50 parts per million is you get 25% more trunk growth by caliper measurement. You can measure it with a caliper. Put it on half and don't put it on the other half. Just see what happens. You'll get 25% more trunk growth just by keeping that sulfur above 50 parts per million. Then the other part of it is the, the guys will start looking and say, yeah, we got 25% more trunk growth, but we get about 30% more leaf as well. If you're looking for leaf, if you're looking for trunk, Sulfur is the key, but sulfur is also the key to anything that's growing underground. Any kind of a root crop, potatoes, uh, even uh, tulip, tulips and iris and flower bulbs and so forth, garlic, onions, whatever it is you're growing underground, they don't just grow better root systems. I've had clients come call and say, where we use sulfur and where we didn't, we got 30% more roots in one year's time or less, even on grasses. Boron deficiency in a pear, well, you don't see that very often. That's a severe deficiency, but boron is hurting you long before that. And what does boron do? Boron actually is the key to getting size. You, if you've got plenty of potassium, you've got to have that. But I had a client here in Michigan uh, near well, he was growing apples, and he sent samples on a number. This is not on his place. This is out of Canada, but I didn't have a picture of his, his Jonathan apple. But I said, you, if you've got any problem here, the boron is so low, you're not going to get good size. And he said, those apples have been there for 20 years, and nobody has ever been able to tell me why we didn't get good size. He said, that's the worst size we got. It was the place where he had the least amount of boron, too. He got the boron levels up, and it came right out of it. Boron can be your limiting factor if you've got enough of everything else. Uh, in terms of blueberries, the two things I get concerned about is the levels of iron and the levels of manganese. And if you can put on limestone and drop those below the minimum level, you just cause the problem. And most of the time when we start looking at, at soils that have blueberries on them, blueberries are growing there because there's enough iron or manganese, but a lot of other things you wouldn't plant there. I mean, uh, I don't have a lot of time to expand on that, but what I'll tell you is, if you've got good iron and manganese levels and you need calcium, you can put calcium on blueberries and you won't hurt them at all. The best blueberries, we see this all over the world. The best blueberries go on the same soil that grows the best alfalfa. You don't need a low pH soil to grow blueberries. What you need is right fertility. If you don't have right fertility, it's better to have a low pH soil to grow blueberries because that low pH makes more iron and manganese available. If you have enough iron and manganese, that's, to me, that's the key in terms of what calcium does. Iron deficiency in raspberries, here's the thing you gotta watch out for. If you have a soil that's really low in iron, then if the iron is a certain level and the manganese is just one part per million higher, it's going to cause an iron deficiency in the plants. But if you take leaves off of those plants right there, those raspberry plants, severe iron deficiency, it's iron chlorosis. You can look at it and say that's iron chlorosis. But if you send those leaves to a lab and have a leaf test done on them, it'll come back and say the iron's good. You cannot pick up this problem from a leaf test. You have to do a soil test. 
what happens is when the manganese is just one part per million higher than the iron, that manganese causes the iron to be oxidized in the leaf. That oxidized iron is not available for the plant, but when you take that leaf off and send it into the lab and they ash that leaf, that oxidized iron looks available. And it'll tell you you don't have an iron problem when you can stand there and look at it and know it's an iron problem. The only way you tell that is by, finding a, a, by taking a soil test where you know, and the, I can't tell you on anybody else's test where those need to be because micronutrients are run in so many different ways. But in our test, once we see the manganese is one part per million above the iron, we're going to tell you, you need to be putting on iron. Iron deficiency in apples. If you have an iron deficiency like this in an apple, it could be you're low in iron. But it could be, in terms of seeing a yellow like that, uh, it could be that the manganese is higher than the iron. Another situation is we'll get samples back from people that pull samples, send them to us, and we get samples from thousands of acres of different types of trees. And on tree crops, we'll have a soil and it shows the iron is deficient. And we'll call up the grower and say, on those spots, this spot, this spot, and this spot, can you pick those out? Oh, yeah, I can, I can tell you where that is. Well, I said, well, go look at them and see if you see a yellow cast on the leaves. Because... If you only take a four inch sample, and that's what they're taking on those trees, iron is the only element that will actually increase below that level. Not always, but nothing else does. But iron can actually be higher below that four inch level than it is at the top. And if that iron's high enough down there and the roots get there, those trees don't have an iron deficiency. But we can't tell that, so we call and say either do a subsoil sample or go take a look at those spots. And if they're still green, don't worry about it. Copper helps control rust and fungus diseases in any crop. If you have a problem with rust and fungus disease, take a look at where your copper level is. Boron is, is one thing that's necessary, but if you don't have enough copper, the boron's not going to work. And the, the one thing that I'll tell you is the more perishable the fruit, the more important it is to have good copper levels. The raspberry growers and blackberry growers that we work with, We'll tell them to get their copper level between 12 and 15 parts per million. And when they get there, whether it's organic or whether it's conventional, they don't have problems with rust. We have a raspberry grower in California, and he says, we can pick in a mist, and we still don't have rust problem. But until, until you get that copper up, that's way higher than what, for wheat, you only need two. For corn, two will stop green snapping corn. It'll stop uh, lodging in corn or wheat, but if you start getting into rust and fungus diseases, then those numbers have to get higher in order to do that, except wheat. At wheat, you get the copper to two, and you've got one part of the field that has copper below two and the other part that's above two, just see if you don't see where the rust comes right to the line. Copper levels for cane crops, that's what I was just talking about. Phosphate for larger leaves, but too much ties up zinc. If you want larger size leaves, get those phosphate levels up between 500 and 750 parts per million, two, P205. That makes, if you're using a water soluble test, that's going to sound, oh, that's way too much. Remember, we're talking P205. That's the same fertilizer analysis that when you go out and buy it from a fertilizer dealer, that's what they're selling you. When they sell you 1846 that's 46 pounds of P205 phosphate. We're measuring in the same thing that the, that the fertilizer dealer is selling it to you at. Otherwise, you've got to remember to do this. If you're looking at elemental phosphate in parts per million, parts per million times two is pounds per acre. So you take that parts per million times two, that gives you pound per acre. Now we've got to convert from elemental P to P205. To do that, you take it times 2.3. Then that gives you the number in pounds per acre of P205. You can convert elemental P in parts per million to uh, P205 in pounds per acre by taking the elemental P times two, take that times 2.3. So these numbers that we report scare people to death sometimes because they're not used to looking at P205. But Dr. Albrecht said, we want to know what they're in a form the plant can use and the farmer can understand if he needs to go buy some or not. And that's the reason we use the test we use. Cool weather can affect zinc uptake by plants. The, the more excess phosphate you have, the harder it is for zinc 
But if you have less than six parts per million zinc, it's a problem anyway. Well, I'm out of time. I'll just say we talked about manganese already. Frost protection, I'm going to go there. If you are worried about frost, this does not protect from a freeze. But I learned this from Dr. Werner Bergman, who was one of the foremost people that studied soil in, the, uh, in uh, Europe. Dr. Bergman actually worked on soils research and has a book that you can get if you can, if you can find it in English. It's about $1,500 a copy now, but it really is a, it, it is a really good book. But this is his recommendation if you want frost protection. And we've had people that say, well, I'm concerned about frost. If it freezes, that's not going to work. But we've had people that have done this and say, look, it works. So I'll just, I'll just put that there. And if, if uh, there's not time for you to get that or you forget it or something or other, now I'm going to skip right on to the end. I w I'd, I'd say something about that, but if you... Uh, Contact me at Neil, Kinsey, Neil at KinseyAg.com. I can send you that formula. Or if you look on our website, it's not on there. But uh, that formula works very well for soils that are well balanced. Well, appreciate your, if, if I could, since we got a break up, I'll be glad to answer your question. But do we have time? We've got a little bit of time. OK. Bitter pitch and honey crisp. Sorry? Bitter pitch, calcium deficiency, and honey crisp apples. Bitter pit. In terms of that calcium deficiency, don't look at the pH. Look at the percentage of calcium you have there. And then the next thing in order, you, you can have the right percentage of calcium in a soil, but what gets calcium into the plant? Only one thing, boron. So you got to have enough boron to get the calcium in. Just because you got 60% calcium, that means we got enough calcium in the soil, but do we have enough boron to get it into the plant? So take a look at your boron as well as keep that calcium. And if it's sand, 60% is likely going to be enough calcium. If it's heavier, you need to be up in that 65 to 70% range in order to do that. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, we have some uh, wine grapes, about seven different varieties. I like sandy loam soil. And we have a source of horse manure. And is there anything I should be more careful about compared to what we've used in the past is maybe uh, pig manure or something else on the horse manure. It's got some uh, wood shavings in it and uh, there's some leftover hay because we see some Roman Timothy come up in the grape rows. Actually, if you're looking at a manure to be a good mild form of manure, to me, horse manure is one of the best. It's not a hot manure. It, it works very well. It's pretty well balanced out. It's just a matter of whether or not, where are your levels? Can we stand the amount of pounds of P or K that's being put on there? Another thing we generally tend to see, horse manure many times is a better source of sulfur than some of the others. So to me, horse manure is really ideal for grapes if you can get enough of it. nitrogen is in there is Dr. Bergman said that nitrogen helps that uh, notice here it says apply as, or as three days ahead of predicted frost if possible sometimes people don't know it's that far ahead or they what he says is that nitrogen is to get it to pull the manganese and the magnesium in it's not a matter that you have to use it but he says it makes the manganese and magnesium more effective it's like the dessert that gets it in there I don't know if he'd say that. That's what I'm saying. But he did say the nitrogen is there in order to, to get the other to be taken in faster. Okay? Yes, sir. Aluminum, uh, aluminum toxicity. What's your model on your test? If, if, if we have a, a client who says we have aluminum toxicity or iron toxicity or manganese toxicity, I've never in all the world seen a place where they didn't have a deficiency of calcium. Uh, you correct the calcium and any one of those three will not be a toxicity anymore. Now, 
there might be an exception to that somewhere if somebody put on a huge amount of aluminum in some kind of a way. But basically where we've looked at uh, the characteristic aluminum toxicities, South Africa sugarcane is one of the biggest examples. And they tell you, the, the researchers there say, the only thing you can do is put on gypsum. You keep putting on gypsum and you'll go down and down and down and down. As soon as you come in there and put enough calcium on to get it up into the 60s, the very next year the yield goes up. And still they say, oh no, calcium doesn't work, you need to use gypsum. It's because they're, not, they're only looking at pH. They're not looking at the percentages. Okay? All right. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you.